lot of neurological complications and this standard is just one by like this. One and a half year he still requires night time ventilation. He is able to walk around, no blood involvement, but he still requires night time ventilation with the tracheostomy in situ. So that severe inverse is taken first. So here the list of differentials, we are inverse had to investigate for everything because it's unusual to have all these complications. So you'll have to investigate for NMO, all those things, whether to give steroids or not to give steroids, it's a big question in this sort of situation. But considering this list of differentials will only make us think systematically, yes, this is a syndromic diagnosis. What are the causes of this syndromic diagnosis? So, okay, so so, yeah. uh, I think it's important to see that any particular infectious agent can cause a list of different neurological uh, involvement or disorders. And also in our experience, we know that if you've got spinal cord involvement, that is much more difficult to treat in a patient than the brain involvement. So, yeah, it's important to be aggressive, uh, to maybe add immunoglobulin, IDLG to steroids. And if needed, consider plasma exchange or some other okay. in the model. Yes. Thank you. So, this is, have you uh, any differential diagnosis on these images? Otherwise, uh, Siddharth will uh, chip in for you. So, these are once again thalamic changes. But these lesions here are showing something. I'll show another images. So, this is black here. So, so yes, yeah. So again, my thalamic involvement on this scan, uh, as you can appreciate, the thalami are really swollen. So it's the reverse as compared to things like hypoxia, where you get atrophy or damage of cells. In this, actually, you've got swelling of the thalami, and inside the thalami, you've got another signal change, like more intense signal in in this sequence, SWI or DWI, which show hemorrhage. So these are patients who come in very rapidly with bithalamic changes, swelling, hemorrhage, uh, which would suggest acute necrotizing encephalitis. So acute necrotizing encephalitis is another common cause of coma. Uh, they rapidly die. The mortality rate is more than 60 percent if we have these kind of images. But within 24, 48 hours they can die. The etiology in the Southeast Asian countries is usually influenza enterovirus. In our setting, we had dengue on influenza common causes. 70 percent we couldn't get etiology at this point of time with all the PCR samples. Dr. Jitendra, can you just uh, take off this case and discuss? Thank you. Uh, so, this is a 12 month old baby who had two days vomiting and diarrhea. There was moderate dehydration, child was treated with IV hydration. On day two, it was found to have irritability, abnormal breathing, anterior fontanel was full. So what is your possibility at this point of time if there is some child who is a dehydration and during that dehydration connection child developed explopathy? So uh, if we commonly think about this electrolytemia and the synovenous thrombosis. So I think it is very important and sometimes both may uh, exist together. So it is important to delineate that the, if you see uh, this carefully, if there is a disc edema, it completely uh, gives the diagnosis of uh, uh, raised intracranial pressure and maybe a very important pointer towards the synovenous thrombosis. So here in this case the disc was edematous. And uh, it is important that sometimes some degree of hyponatremia uh, or hyponatremia may be there. And sometimes one may uh, think it's the, that degree of hyponatremia or hyponatremia is completely responsible. But, but it is very important that the encephalopathy persists after the correction of the uh, dysentrolytemia. So I should carefully try to exclude the synovenous thrombosis. In this case, the MRI was done, and you can see the some uh, hyperintense swelling and the hypo uh, intense changes in the cerebellum. Which is very strong pointer to suggest uh, sinovenous thrombosis of the uh, transverse sinus. So it is a case of the uh, sinovenous thrombosis. So child was treated with uh, hydration correction, low molecular weight filling, and remained 48 hours, but again deteriorated after. So anybody can shout out what could be the possibility: a child with sinovenous thrombosis who again got deteriorated. Uh, it was a uh, acute deterioration, uh, not very acute. I think over 48 hours it was deteriorated. So one may think child may be on anticoagulation, it could be bleed. 
but at Dr. Lokesh's describe the lead will for the acute encephalopathic presentation. If it is an evolving encephalopathy, it could be uh, something else. So uh, in this case, the race ICP was already there. We need to look at the imaging. At the so, so the imaging reveals the hydrocephalus. So that was the responsible for the deterioration in this case because the cytovenous thrombosis causing the pressure over the bone ventricle and there was the obstructive hydrocephalus. So, uh, and the child subsequently required the uh, drainage procedures and the child recovered in subsequent follow. So, careful diagnosis is very important for a successful management. So, first pathology that is dehydration causing cytomatous thrombosis that causing obstruction of the body acts of the stag muscle as well, localizing to the medulla and the spinal cord. So that's why we the category of thromboencephalomyelitis and this whole list of differentials which you need to consider. And this child had pan cord myelitis and it was secondary to H1N1 myelitis. Influenza. So influenza can cause a lot of neurological complications and this child had H1N1 myelitis. One and a half year he still requires nighttime ventilation. He's able to walk around, no blood involvement, but he still requires nighttime ventilation with the tracheostomy in situ. So that severe inverse is taken like first. So here the list of differentials, we are inverse had to investigate for everything because it's unusual to have all these complications. So you'll have to investigate for NMO, all those things, whether to give steroids or not to give steroids, it's a big question in this sort of situation. But Considering this list of differentials will only make us think systematically, yes, this is syndromic diagnosis. What are the causes of this syndromic diagnosis? Ah, so, you're right. so, so, okay, so, this one yeah. so yeah. Uh, I think it's important to see that any particular infectious agent can cause a list of different neurological uh, involvement or disorders. And also in our experience, we know that if you've got spinal cord involvement, that is much more difficult to treat in a patient than the brain involvement. So yeah, it's important to be aggressive, uh, to maybe add immunoglobulin, IDIG to steroids, and if needed, consider plasma exchange or some other immunoglobulin. Sure. Thank you. So, this, have you uh, any differential diagnosis on these images? Otherwise, uh, Siddharth will uh, chip in for you. So these are once again thalamic changes, but these lesions here are showing something. I'll show another images. So this is black here. So see that? So yes, yeah. So again, my thalamic involvement on this scan, uh, as you can appreciate, the thalami are really swollen. So it's the reverse as compared to things like hypoxia where you get atrophy or damage of cells. In this actually you've got swelling of the thalami and inside the thalami you've got another signal change, hypo intense signal in, in this sequence SWI or DWI would show hemorrhage. So these are patients who come in very rapidly with bithalamic changes, swelling, hemorrhage, uh, which would suggest acute necrotizing encephalitis. So acute necrotizing encephalitis is another common cause of coma. Uh, they rapidly die. The mortality rate is more than 60% if we have these kind of images. But within 24-48 hours they can die. The etiology in the Southeast Asian countries is usually influenza enterovirus. In our setting we had dengue on influenza as common causes. 70% we couldn't get etiology at this point of time with all the PCR surveillance. Dr. Jitendra, can you just uh, take over this case and discuss? Well, thank you. Uh, so, this is a 12 month old baby who had two days vomiting and diarrhea. There was moderate dehydration, child was treated with IV hydration. On day two, it was found to have irritability, abnormal breathing. Anterocontinent was full. So, what is your possibility at this point of time if there's some child who's a dehydration and during that dehydration correction, child developed explopathy? So, uh, if we commonly think about this electrolytemia and the cytovenous thrombosis, so I think it is very important and sometimes both may uh, exist together. So, it is important to delineate that the, if you see uh, this carefully, if there is a disc edema, it completely uh, gives the diagnosis of uh, uh, raised intracranial pressure and maybe a very important pointer towards the cytovenous thrombosis. So here in this case the disc was edematous and uh, 
it is important that sometimes some degree of hyponatremia uh, or hyponatremia may be there. And sometimes one may uh, think it's the, that degree of hyponatremia or hyponatremia is completely responsible. So, but it is very important that the encephalopathy persists after the correction of the uh, dyslipidinitemia. So, you should carefully try to exclude the sanguineous thrombosis. In this case, the MRI was done, and you can see that some uh, hyperintense swelling and the hypo uh, intense changes in the cerebellum. It is very strong pointer to suggest uh, sinovenous thrombosis of the uh, transfer sinus. So it is a case of the uh, sinovenous thrombosis. So child was treated with uh, hydration correction, low molecular weight refining, and remained 48 hours, but again deteriorated after. So anybody can shout out what could be the possibility: a child with sinovenous thrombosis who again got deteriorated. Uh, it was an uh, acute deterioration, uh, not very acute, I think over 48 hours it was deteriorated. So one may think child may be on anticoagulation, it could be bleed, but as Dr. Lokesh has described, the acute bleed will cause the acute encephalopathic presentation. If it is an evolving encephalopathy, it could be uh, something else. So uh, in this case, the race ICP was already there, we need to look at the imaging. So, so the imaging reveals the hydrocephalus. So that was the responsible for the deterioration in this case because the sinovenous thrombosis causing the pressure over the port ventricle and there was an obstructive hydrocephalus. So uh, and the child subsequently required the uh, drainage procedures and the child recovered in subsequent follow. So a careful diagnosis is very important for a successful management. So what? Pathology that is dehydration causing sinovenous thrombosis that causing obstruction. That when you have done first neuroimaging, it's not enough. So every time there is a deterioration, you may require to ask for repeat scan at a part. I mean, you have to anticipate and decide your investigations and neuroimaging may be required to be repeated when you have certain new signs which are developing in the scenario. Yeah, we can take for the next case. So this is a 11 year old boy who presented with high grade fever. He had a flushed appearance and on day 2 of uh, his fever, he developed altered sensorium, had generalized hypotonia and brisk reflexes. He required ventilation. At that point of time, CT was done which showed edema. CSF was done which was normal and child persisted to have altered sensorium. So he was, uh, his scan was done. Prior to seeing the scan, what do you people see that it is, this is a child who has got high grade fever, flushed appearance and altered sensorium, but we are not getting any signs of focality. It could be an in infective or inflammatory cause of febrile encephalopathy, but there are no focal signs which are seen. But at the same time, we can see that there is severe amount of altered sensorium which tells you that okay, there is either bilateral uh, cortical involvement or a diffuse cortical dysfunction or there is some amount of brainstem involvement. So it's, it's something which requires urgent management. So MRI was done and you can see that MRI shows by this, uh, yeah, it's bilateral. I mean, this is a fair image which shows a bilateral diffuse white matter hyperintensity. They are not symmetrical, they are asymmetrical diffuse uh, white matter intense, hyperintensities. So, what do you think is the differential in this patient? It's most commonly it is demyelinating encephalomyelitis. If, if it was viral encephalitis, we could have seen something on the gray matter. Gray matter is not looking very uh, involved. Gray matter does not show any intensities. It's white matter mainly, so it's basically a white matter disease. Acute onset. The acute onset, the ventricles are not seen normally. If it was old case of white matter involvement, you should have seen some effect of brain matter atrophy or white matter atrophy along with that. So it's an acute onset disease, it's edem. So the child was diagnosed as edem. The early methylprednisolone was given for three days. He improved, he was excubated. 
but again everything does not go very smoothly day 5 platelets drop and he started having third spacing and that time that point of time then you uh, serology was sent and it came as positive so then you infection with eden and he was uh, followed up later on he was normal after three months so usually we say that eden is a para infectious or a post infectious disorder so you have some infection and then there is a latent period after that you get an immune response of the body which leads to a demyelination but this may not be always true this like then you sometimes can have this eden type of a presentation which is Uh, and which is seen in the you with uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. So, ADN can also be para-infectious or post-infectious, or during infection also they can see this type of a severe demyelination which requires steroids. Okay, so it is very important to get an MRI done when you are seeing a child with a acute febrile encephalopathy with this with a degree, severe degree of heart sensory. Thank you. I think one of the take home point is the neurological manifestations of dengue in the first two three days. Even before you start thinking of dengue, the platelets don't start dropping by the time neurological manifestations are already full blown. So that is the clue in the season. The first appearance, that's why you put it up. So with the first appearance, you all start thinking of dengue. So that's the clue here. So Dr. Siddharth, uh, can you just describe this case? Yes. So in the clinical details, we've got a five month old boy. Uh, uh, we are assuming no past medical history. Uh, he's coming with a respiratory distress and referred as bronchitis. But on your examination, he's got altered sensorium and asymptomatic breathing. He was intubated, so that's quite rapidly progressing illness. Uh, and no other systemic abnormalities on examination. Uh, normal head size, pupils are equal size, reacting, and generalized hypotonia is noticed on examination. So, I think the cause of concern here is whilst it's, it's a respiratory infection, it seems like he's rapidly progressing with acidotic breathing, altered sensorium, and hypotonia. Uh, I mean, this is a fairly uh, relatively common scenario. We see that in young children, respiratory infection can unmask an underlying etiology. So it could be anything starting from neuromuscular to metabolic diseases to mitochondrial diseases. Here, because of the altered sensorium, I would surely consider metabolic or mitochondrial uh, etiology. And uh, okay, so uh, I was going to say that neuroimaging is quite helpful in these scenarios. There are different pictures to metabolic and mitochondrial disorders in this age group. So here we're seeing a CT scan which shows quite a lot of clear bilateral hypointensity in the product and the pituitary. So the basal ganglia system. Basal ganglia is again very sensitive to metabolic and mitochondrial emergencies because it's very highly metabolic uh, area and when you become unwell it can lead to a crisis and hypotensity. So I would go ahead and investigate this patient. Uh, I would do a metabolic screen including lactate, ammonia, and uh, blood gas as you mentioned earlier. Uh, in this patient we had a high plasma lactate and a high CSF lactate. So mitochondrial disorder would be high on the list. Uh, during mitochondrial decompensation you almost always get high lactates. CSF lactate is more sensitive for neurological disorders than plasma lactate. And in this patient, because of bilateral basal ganglia involvement, we're thinking of Lee's disease, which is a type of uh, spectrum of mitochondrial disorders. But also, I wouldn't, you know, totally rule out uh, in the presence of lactate and basal ganglia, uh, methylmalonic acidemias, propionic acidemia, uh, even glutaric acidemia, to mention the normal head size. I think one of the important things in this sort of situation is considered primary deficiency, okay, which is present exactly similar. The acidosis may not be so high, but in extrusive breastfed infants, all of these children should require a good dosage of IV time. And if they start improving, we yeah, supplement the mother as well with the time and if she is breastfeeding. Now, we have just uh, seven minutes, so we'll quickly go through. Uh, this 14 year old boy from Gunto, normal school going boy, defibrillate onset of two episodes of seizures in quick clusters in half an hour, generally seizures, and grafts into altered sensorium, not very deep altered sensorium, had normal growth parameters, GCS was 12 by 15, Patas was normal, no meningeal signs, no lateralizing resistance, so very rapid onset. 
So you have list of the cipher actual concept running through your mind. So you have a blood pressure 140 by 96. So that will make you think of press posterior reversible recurrent cephalopathy which will cause uh, this situation. Skin was normal, pupils were equal size reacting. History there was no coca color urine or no swelling of eyelids to suggest it. Usually, a gastroprococcal infection causing glomerular arthritis. That's a common association of high blood pressures and the encephalopathy. Normal blood investigations, normal urine protein, EEG done, mild diffuse flowing, no evidence of the seizures, normal brain MRI, normal CSF. Uh, they are returned from US two years back and settled here, no recent travel history. So, what else you would like to do? So, it's still encephalopathic day two, no further seizures. All your investigations are normal. Blood pressures after the initial death started normalizing and there are no further episodes. Urine routine examination, ultrasound, PT were normal. So, because it was hyperacute onset, one of the things was hypertension, the vascular, but because his encephalopathy, confusional state was going on, in spite of very transient hypertension, we sent a urine toxicology and he was last seen 4 hours before the onset of the episode with his friends, no previous similar episodes. He had a marijuana positive of the urine. So, marijuana, uh, drug, drug, uh, uh, so that is said, uh, 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 I do not know how he got access, his friends probably. So he had marijuana, he had taken the marijuana and then he lapsed into altered sensory. Okay. So sometimes this sort of things, you're, all other investigations will not give you clue. So thinking laterally, it was hyperactive onset, vascular, toxin, trauma. So you roam around that because all other investigations have not given a clue. Okay. Fine. So the next uh, case, uh, Dr. Jitendra. Twenty-one-year-old girl who admitted with history of fever, parotid swelling, and mild swallowing difficulty. So it initially looks like some mouse-like filtration. On day three of admission, child collapsed in the ward. Acute encephalopathic, low GCS, pupils uh, sluggish reacting, poor respiratory efforts, normal fundi, but there was hypotonia and sluggish DTR. So acute encephalopathy, diminished reflexes. Hypertension, blood pressure more than 99 since uh, centile, and over 24 hours there was further loss of anti gravity movement. So, what could be the possibilities one can think? It was an acute penetration, so one may think about the posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome because there is a hypertension, or it could be the acute posterior circulation stroke. But the CT scan was done, it was normal, although it doesn't rule out completely. CSF was done to rule out. Uh, Again, it was normal. So, any possibilities at this point of time? So, uh, subsequently, the nerve conduction study is done because there is pro uh, progressive loss of uh, uh, paraphrases or, uh, and uh, the NCV revealed the motor sensory encephalopathy on day 3. So, there was a combination of encephalopathy and the uh, uh, peripheral neuropathy. So, any possibility one can shout at this point? So one should need to look at the combinations like toxins can cause the two neuraxis involvement or the metabolic ones, mitochondrial ones or the nutritional ones. So subsequently a very simple uh, investigation confirms the diagnosis, encephalopathy, peripheral and that's the uh, urine, uh, if it was placed over the sunlight exposure and the open air, it was done to like uh, some uh, like a color color. So it was a diagnosis of porphyria. So it's very important uh, your clinical uh, diagnosis. So uh, that will be supported by the investigation. So once again, it's a very rapid progressive. All of these cases are what we have managed. Nothing else. So they rapidly all in front of your eyes. And while you are managing, if you are not thinking laterally, the combination of hypertension and you have quadrant paralysis, which is LM and axonal neuropathy. So you think of uh, your uh, bigger staff encephalitis, which can also cause uh, lower motor neuron, upper motor neuron, <coughs> mitochondria, and porphyria. It's adolescent girl. That is a typical age where the porphyria decomposes after the infection. Metabolic risk. So, Dr. Shilpa, this is a seven year old boy who was admitted. Yes. Admitted with history of uh, fever, altered sensorium, 
And went on to continue to have water sensitive even into day 15 of illness. Had two MRIs which were normal, two CSFs which were normal. So you had this abnormal movement. So uh, you can see the video. This the child is the child is showing some abnormal movements. He's staring towards one side. He has continuous oromotor problems and he has a hand which is in an odd posture. It's a dystonic posture. So these are typical uh, features of a facio brachial uh, dystonic posturing. And at the same time, same child is seen. He is not. I mean, he is continuously moving. So these are stereotypies. These are abnormal movements which are present in a child who has altered sensorium. Sensor, I mean, he is not completely comatose, but he, ha he is lethargic, he is drowsy, and he ha whenever he is arousable, he has these abnormal movements. So, a child presenting with fever, seizures, which are very odd type of seizures, facio-brachial dystonic movements, along with this stereotype, most common diagnosis is uh, autoimmune encephalitis. So, autoimmune encephalitis, which is a parainfectious or a paraneoplastic disorder. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you have the next slide? Yeah. So, these are the, so, I mean, this is a infectious or a paraneoplastic disorder which are commonly seen in pediatrics. Nowadays, they say that autoimmune encephalitis has, the, uh, I mean, it was initially undiagnosed or was rarely diagnosed. But around when you see the uh, incidences, it is around second to the viral encephalitis in the uh, pediatric population. Okay, so it's very common. It requires a different management, uh, different line of management. Like it requires steroids, IVIG, and other type of investigations. Like autoimmune, uh, anti nlg receptor antibodies, anti vgk receptor antibodies. So all these things need to be done. And it's a very rewarding uh, disorder. It requires a long term treatment. It may require 3 to 6 months treatment. But at the end of it, the uh, I mean, you can see the child at the end, end of the year. Yeah, so just uh, another 3 minutes, please. Yes, please, three minutes. So it's very important to recognize this because your MRI will not give you a Your CSF routine will not give you a clue. This clinical impression, what we saw the video of peripheral dyskinesia abnormal posturings, abnormal movements which you have never seen in any of the classical movement disorders that is probably NMDA. Okay. So that will have to ask for CSF, NMDA receptor antibodies which is easily available across few centers now and quick turnaround time within 3 days you can get the confirmation and that actually requires aggressive immuno moderation and the outcomes are generally pretty good in 80% of the children who are predicted less than 15 days of uh, the onset of the problem. So, if they are managing children with oncological problems and they lapse into altered sensorium, then we have a list of things you need to consider slightly differently. It can be because of intracranial bleed, it can be methotrexate induced neurotoxicity. If you give IT methotrexate within one week or uh, ten days, if they develop neurological complications, including spinal cord presentation, then think of methotrexate induced neurotoxicity. Cerebral synovenous thrombosis, a large paraginase is known to cause. Uh, central synovenous thrombosis and uh, they can have sepsis and systemic inflammatory response syndrome, hyperreforces, thoughts more than one lakh, slightly circulation also, also can cause uh, similar problem and CNS relapse is other thing which can present with neurological uh, problems. So the last uh, category, this is a child who had initially a vascular lesion in the left hand, they had come for initial consultation and then after 15 days the child came with a seizure and focal weakness on the uh, right side. So what are these lesions on the MRI? The hyperintense lesions on the flare images, uh, sorry, diffusion weighted images. This is which territory? This is right anterior cerebral artery. This is left middle cerebral artery and this is posterior cerebral artery. So all three different arterial territories are important. So very likely you are dealing with Moya Moya, Moya Moya syndrome. So, this is a vascular cause of altered sensory. We can see the internal carotid artery is not seen at all on this side. This is very hypoplastic. This is your vertebral artery, but the PCA is once again very narrowed out. Correct? They are syndromic. 
there are syndromic vascularizations which can have multi-system involvement. We have children with vascular pH, with moya moya, so there are combinations, which is because of a genetic So that's the vascular, vascular cause of uh, this one. This is another child, 3 year old, run off by tractor on the neck. And uh, initial two days he was fine, third day he developed hemiparesis and altered sensorium. So what do you think of? Hemiparesis altered sensorium. So this is a large stroke causing altered sensorium. This is dissection. Trauma, stroke, altered sensorium, think of dissection. Okay, so this is the child who had an intracranial artery uh, on the left side dissection which causes stroke and artery sensorium. Where your treatment of choice should be not aspirin, it is anticoagulation. Summary, you will have to say whether it is onset is hyperacute, acute or subacute. So first by that will give a lot of etiological classification. Then etiological categories considered systematically infection, once again viral, bacterial and your protozoal. Fungal inflammation, your uh, inflammatory processes, uh, trauma, toxins, malignancy, metabolic nutrition. So you have to categorically write down. Then you will say, okay, these are the odd points, this is definitely not possible. So then there is less chance of missing out on the investigations after diagnosis. Okay, the investigation, all the systematic, uh, uh, they consider all the differentials, then early investigations. What are your pre-test possibilities? Okay, this is going to be this. And post-test plan, if this is negative, what are you going to do next? So that plan should be there. Because you are managing the acute care well in several cases. So, ABC, airway breathing circulation, antibiotics, antivirus, antibiotics, your set reaction is usually good enough. And then your azithromycin for mycoplasma and rickets here. And uh, antivirals, acyclovir, you are going to start when you don't have a clue. And probably your uh, uh, antivirals for the uh, H1N1 of the flu as well. Antimalarials in the area where it is endemic. anti epileptics depending on the requirement and anti edema measures. Supportive measures. So all these things need to be done. Thank you. If there are any questions, you can ask. Thank you experts for uh, elaborating promoting disorders in details to all of us. Uh, I request all the experts to gather in the front of the uh, desk for the presentation. Moving on to an extremely delicate topic of babies in care. I take the privilege to invite an expert speaker and neurologist, Dr. Rahul Karma, on the stage to write the topic. I request Dr. Uday Kai, Dr. Sachin Salani to share this. So it's, it's very important for us to understand 
that the transition of a fetus to a newborn is a very, very complex procedure and despite almost over 100 years of uh, investigation, pondering, it's still not very clear why something happens at that time. Boiling it down to the skin, it is very important to, to figure out how the fetus, when it becomes a newborn, the skin needs to act as a barrier to water loss, light and irritants, which was not happening in the intrauterine environment. It has to take over the function of infection control and immunosurveillance, and that is one of the things how atopic dermatitis, allergic reactions, irritant dermatitis come into play. Uh, it needs to be resilient towards mechanical trauma and we understand that much more clearly in the preterm skin which is highly predisposed to injury. Uh, it needs to develop its sensation and tactile stimulation, one of the five special senses. It needs to thermoregulate and the sweat glands are very important with the other neuroendocrine process which will take care of temperature, attempt to take care of the temperature maintenance. And of course over time it needs to generate an acid mantle formation which protects the skin and its structures. So this is how the structure of the skin looks like and you basically have the stratum corneum, you have the epidermis and then you have the dermis which is that well. Each one plays a different function and of course the physical barrier is the stratum corneum. Uh, normally there are about 90 to 100 layers of these dead flattened epithelial cells which form the stratum corneum and they help with physical protection of the underlying skin. As you can see over here, the dermis is much more resilient and keeps on generating nutrition and other cells to help in the uh, structure of the skin. Uh, there is tactile stimulation, thermal regulation, all of these functions are very complex and need to be in appropriate amounts and development to be able to function. There is quite a lot of controversy over how much is the newborn skin developed at birth and, and overall the message we get across uh, various studies is that it is very difficult to evaluate for reasons of ethical point. If you don't take a biopsy from a normal baby and send it for an analysis, you need to be able to indirectly assess and one of the assessments can be done through transepidermal water loss which is now used as a surrogate marker for skin function. Uh, the normal transepidermal water loss is roughly 4 to 8 grams per meter square per hour which is the adult value. But the same value is seen in term newborns and in infants. So that comes to a conclusion that the newborn skin is actually as mature in its function uh, in most of the cases as it does. So despite being in a watery environment, I mean, you dip your finger in, in water outside for five minutes and your finger becomes a wrinkled gray. But this baby has been dancing for almost nine months in an intermeotic fluid environment and is able to maintain its skin integrity, which is hats off to the constituents of the amniotic fluid, the temperature, and of course the vagina. So whatever said and done, a term baby will have the same integral function uh, read as the PWL as an adult skin and it is only what happens after birth and how the environment interacts with the skin which will bring about a change and possible problems with the newborn skin. So this was as far as term babies is concerned. When we look at preterms, however, younger the gestation, the trans epidermal water loss is actually much more. As you can see it's almost 10 times that of a normal term newborn.